All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Robin Walters. I'm a journalist. I run a website called tech.eu, where we write about European technology companies. Um, first of all, uh, I don't know if this was mentioned, um, but uh, there was a bit of a mix-up. So um, we're actually not going to talk that much about cybersecurity. Um, sorry for that. But it's going to be a really interesting discussion, so stay anyway. Um, and also, the speaker after us, Miko Hipponen from F-Secure, is pretty much the, the number one speaker on cybersecurity in the world. So. So that should be a treat, so just stick around. Uh, so John, uh, honored to have you here at Flush. Um, is this your first time at Flush? Yeah, it's my, it my first uh, time, yeah. That's surprising, actually. Um, um, so for those who don't know, John spent uh, about 15 years building Opera software from scratch out of Norway. Um, left in 2010, 2011, in different stages. And what did you do after? Why didn't you tell us? I mean. Basically, what happened after I left Opera, I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do when I grow up? So I went through a phase, first finding out where do I want to live in the world, because suddenly I had the chance to live anywhere. I went through a process, and I ended up actually deciding to, to move to the US, to the, to the East Coast. And I, I wanted to see, am I able to be on the other side? So I've been building a, a startup all my life, started in 94, basically straight out of school. And suddenly, I was focusing on, 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 on building, uh, well, doing, I, want, I needed to do something else, right? And, and I wanted to find out, can I be on the other side? And as part of that, I, I, I started investing in startups. It kind of came very naturally for me. I wanted to be a, a good partner for startups, and I uh, selected a few companies. I, I invested in, uh, we want to know in Norway, building great uh, kind of mathematical applications, learning applications. And I invested in a bunch of companies in, in, in Iceland. Was that as an angel investor, or did you ever consider like, starting a VC fund as some entrepreneurs? No, I mean, I, I actually got uh, requests from a number of funds and the like that wanted me to either come and work in the funds or start a fund in my name or, 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 or anything like that. But my thinking is, in, in those cases, I wouldn't be able to make the choices myself. And I also wanted to be a really good investor. I, I wanted to be the good guy. Uh, I had dealt with very difficult investors at Opera, and I really wanted to be, okay, I, I want to be the kind of investor that I would have liked to have myself. So I decided to go in a bunch of companies and, 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 and support them, and uh, I think it's been good. Fast forward to today, where you're building a browser company again, uh, Vivaldi. Um, last week, you entered public beta. Um, before that, you had a technical preview that was also available online. I think you had 2 million downloads yes. of the technical preview alone. Um, so that's quite impressive. Um, but what are the numbers looking right now? Because you launched last week in beta, so... It's continuing to grow. It's looking very good. Right. Any numbers, percentage? Growth? I haven't uh, given any other numbers out so far. Right but it's looking very good. Right. Uh, what's the main reason of doing a technical preview before going into beta stage in the first place? It, it was really a question of ensuring the certain quality. Uh, we had been working on this for some time. We felt that it was ready to, to show it out there, so we did the technical preview. And again, we did four technical preview, and we did 52 releases during those 10 months, uh, snapshots and, and, and things like that. So we were sending out releases to our friends all the time, and uh, then we felt, okay, is it ready now? Yes, it is. It's, it's a beta. And, and similarly, we will have uh, the typical question, when is final ready? It's when it's ready. It's, uh, we, we Do you reckon a year, months, weeks? It, it's more months than years, let's put it that way. OK, so um, you're out here building a browser company, but that was not the initial goal. I mean, it's not like you left Opera with the intention of doing another browser company. This sort of happened, right? Um, but why? So my, my thinking, obviously, I built Opera, right, uh, with a, a brilliant team. And I'd be, we have been doing this for uh, 17 years. And, and clearly, the idea of using any other browser was extremely foreign to me. But then there were some decisions that were made at Opera, right? We had built our own kernel, our own browser kernel, Presto, which was a fantastic piece of code. The guys that made this were obviously brilliant. Uh, we had a piece of code that would run on almost anything with hardly any memory. It was memory safe. It was fast. It was a brilliant piece of coding. Uh, but Opera didn't feel that it was worthwhile building it anymore, so they threw it away. Okay? That's one thing. The second thing is Opera also felt that um, they wanted to address a bigger audience, right? 
So Opera was always a browser with a ton of features. And they decided, OK, we don't want those features anymore. And we'll build a simpler browser because we'll get a bigger community by doing that. It, it, it's a choice. But all those users that were using the desktop version of Opera, about 60 million, a lot of them had chosen it. I mean, no one really got it with a computer. So all of them had made a conscious choice to choose it. And the reason why they were using it was the features it had to offer. And they were unhappy. Um, they were really unhappy. And um, they started sending me emails. Can't you do something about this? Can't you help us? Um, and I mean, there was a lot of discontent, which actually, I mean, Opera ended up closing down their community site and uh, ch changing it into forums. And I think that's maybe, maybe be some ways related also costs, just saving money, saving money, saving money. So um, I thought, OK, the users are unhappy. Uh, I was in a similar situation. I had been using this browser for all this year, and suddenly it didn't look the same. Yes, it had the same, it had the same logo. Um, it was built by my friends that were still working at Opera. Uh, and I had tried to talk to them, guys, kind of, is something going to happen here? Are you going to add this feature or that feature? I'm really missing that. And then I was thinking, it's not going to happen. So it, if no one else is going to do this, I guess it's our turn. Well, um, so if I, if I hear you correctly, like Opera, you saw them throw away the kernel. You, you saw them strip down um, the browser uh, in terms of features to make it broader. Um, so I guess the direction that you're going in with Vivaldi is more a browser for power users. So not like a mass product, but a product for people who really, really you know, use the web very intensively. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean. If you're the kind of user that uses Facebook, YouTube, and a couple of news sites, you, you don't need a lot of functionality, right? And I think you can use any of the browsers. And all the browsers are trying to gather for that group, really. The, the idea you start without tabs, and, and you don't really do anything very advanced. Uh, in our case, we are thinking it, it's an, uh, this is an advanced user. They have requirements. They have opinions. They want to change how the browser looks. They want to interact with the browser in ways that you don't see in all the browsers. And that's what we're going for. So we're going for a fresher look. If you download Vivaldi, you'll see it looks better, in my humble opinion. I think I'm getting, we're getting a lot of feedback that people think it looks great. Um, and, but my thinking is, after a while, you, you tweak it a little bit. You start to use the more the different functionality that's in there. And the feeling that we are hearing from people, and the intended one, is it feels like it was made for you, just for you. Because when you had, you didn't really think that anyone would take into consideration your little preferences. But they are all in there. You go in, you change a couple of preferences. And if they're not, and you have a preference, or anyone here has a preference, we will put them into our list, and gradually we'll get them all in there. That, that's our goal. Um, so a lot of the other browser companies, including Opera, has a um, mail client as well. Is that also in the works? Is that in the plans? Uh, we're working on a mail client, yeah. Anything else? Uh, a lot. <laughs> I mean, so we're starting on desktop. We're starting with uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, mobile is in the plans. And then we have a wealth of features. We have a very, very, very long list of small things and big things that we'll be adding. Again, we, we don't think there's a limit to what we should be adding. It's basically based on, is someone asking for it, or do we think it's a good idea? Nice. Um, you mentioned that you're going desktop first, mobile second, which is kind of odd, because you went through the whole mobile boom at Opera, um, you know, in terms of devices, penetration, uh, et cetera. Um, so if I would think that you're building a browser company from start, I would think you would go mobile first and desktop second. So why is that not the case? Uh, I, I think what you said there, kind of the, the focus of things in some ways. When everyone else is focused on one thing, I like to do something different, right? right. In some ways, going a bit, a bit against the stream. And uh, in particular, we also saw a, a great discontent among the users uh, that were using Opera 12. And in some ways, we are, we are building a browser for them, our friends, and anyone else that wants to join the group. And that's really the focus. So we saw a, a desperate need there. I think on the mobile side, we get a little bit more time. Uh, and I think the mobiles are developing in a way which is allowing us to do a lot of cool stuff. So we felt that the, the need was bigger on the, on the desktop side in the short term. Um, you mentioned that you really liked what Opera was doing in terms of Presto, the kernel. Mm -hmm. So is that something you're also going to do with Vivaldi? 
Uh, I, I think building a browser from scratch, the engine itself, it's, it's, it's not trivial. Uh, there's a reason why small companies like Google and Apple found out they couldn't. Uh, I don't think we can do it either. At Opera, we had a, a team of 100 people working on Presto. And to be frank, that team needed to be expanded. I would have added uh, some tens of people to ensure that it was, because we had this rule, if you're not best at something, it's a bug. And if, if you, if that means that you have to have enough resources to get the job done. So I would say probably now 150 to 200 person team uh, to cover all the bases. Um, and then, well, there's, there's a lot of work to do. So I think we are talking 10 years of programming maybe to get to, because it's not really about just delivering the first level, right? You have to battle test it on the whole web. And even though Opera had 350 million users, we were still being told that we didn't have enough users, well, market share to be considered. Um, I don't know. I mean, I come from a country with 300,000 people. I think anything uh, above that is a lot of people and probably even less. I mean, my hometown was like 5,000 people. So I think the idea that 350 million isn't a lot, uh, I don't know. Is that the kind of number that you want for Vivaldo as well, like 350 million? I mean, from our side, we're building this for our friends. We'll see where this goes. I don't want to go out and say, OK. Well, we're two million friends. Yeah, two million, yeah, two million downloads. We, we don't have two million active users yet, but we're getting there. Um, but clearly, I, I, I think it's possible to get a lot of users. Uh, but 350 million, when we started Opera, we didn't have 350, uh, 350 million. We had a goal. After a few years, we said, OK, let's go for 100. It's a nice round figure. And it was a great feeling when we got to 100 million. But um, I mean, we can do quite well. Uh, we, we need a few million users to break even financially. And then anything above that, we can reinvest and, and, and add more people and do more things. And, and then the sky's the limit. But uh, going out there with a company with 30 people and saying we're going to kind of be world beaters, uh, I think we'll maybe do that a little bit later. Uh, so you mentioned financial, so that brings me to my next question. What's the business model behind it? Is it similar to what Opera is doing? Or? Yeah, I mean, obviously at Opera, we ended up having very many different business models because of the question of who we are selling to. But for the comparative, the same product, meaning the desktop and the mobile browser for end users, it's really about selecting the right partners. It's selecting search, selecting a bookmarks partner that generate a little bit of revenue. The, the revenue per user per year at Opera is about a dollar. So that's kind of our, our, our benchmark. And uh, again, then it's really a question of how many users we manage to get that will like our product. Um, you obviously have a good reputation in this market. People know you. Um, so that, I guess that makes it easier to get partners on board and, and also help you with the initial buzz about you know, doing a new browser. Um, how, in what percentage, do you, well, to what degree do you think it helped that it's you involved rather than you know, a completely new startup doing a browser? I think uh, clearly it helps that people notice who I am and who the team is and recognizes also what we are doing from what we used to do at Opera. People know what we are about. They know what we want to do and our thinking and our philosophies and our goals. And, and obviously that helps. We don't have to tell people who we are. They know who we are. They know what we want to do. And uh, obviously that helps. Um, you're 30 people already, you mentioned. Um, obviously, you're not making money yet. So where is the money coming from? Did you raise investment? This is all coming out of your own pocket? My pocket. And how long do you think you can keep that up? I'll keep it going until we are profitable. I mean, the thing is, uh, uh, let's put it this way. I, 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 as it's been clear, I had issues at Opera with difficult investors that wanted to sell the company and wanted us to optimize for a sale. And it was a difficult time for seven years. And uh, I don't really want to do that again. Now, obviously, there's a lot of good investors out there. But you know what? There's only one that I feel I can trust 100%. Yourself. And that's myself, yeah. Very interesting. Um, but I mean, you want the company to grow. Um, so that means at some point, you might get into the same situation where you have to make a decision. Are we going public? Do we raise funding uh, for accelerated growth? So. No, it, I mean, it's very simple from this perspective. We, we need a few million users, right? We need a few million users and we break even. From that time on, we are profitable. 
uh, we don't need then external funding. Uh, our goal is to grow the company as far as we can. It, it's a focus on the user. That matters. We're going to build a great product, and hopefully a lot of people like what we're doing, and they want to use the product that we build. And we'll do our best to adapt to everyone. And I, I actually believe that works. It, it worked for us at Opera, right? So from that perspective, do we need to do anything differently from that perspective? It's just put the user in, uh, in the center, build great products, and uh, spread the word through word of mouth, mostly. So stepping aside from Vivaldi and Opera, um, you also did a lot of work as an angel investor, but there's more to it. Um, Innovation House, for example, in Iceland. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I mean, w when I started to work with these different, uh, I, I, so I invested in a number of companies. And in some ways, I was also thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a place for startups? The kind of place that I wanted to have, not uh, the automatic accelerator or anything, just, just a place, a nice place uh, at a cheap price so we did that. We, we found this uh, office space that had been uh, empty for some years. This is in Iceland, this right? This is in Iceland, in my hometown of, of Seltinanes, which uh, has about 5,000 people in it, which is on the suburbs of Reykjavik, basically. And we found this building, and uh, about 800 square meters, and, and we could put in some startups there. So between 15 and 20. We've been 20. We've been going a bit down because some of the companies have been growing like Vivaldi. We've taken up more offices, so, and there's a few others that are doing the same. Um, we're then doing things slightly different. We, we, have, some, um, we have some apartments, uh, so we can have guests, and, and we like that. And we actually then have gatherings there for the Vivaldi team, and we stay there together, because we are, as a team, we are distributed, so we are one of those that are utilizing those facilities. Um, and then in the US, I put up another one. I found this old hotel from 1880, and it has 17 bedrooms, and it's kind of another, it's a gathering place. So it's a gathering place for those that are coming from Iceland or Norway. I, have a, I work with the Startup Lab in Oslo as well. Uh, I'm in, in a founders fund that they have there associated with the Startup Lab. So we, we receive companies from, from Iceland and Norway, and they come and they stay with us. Uh, some of them are coming for kind of just working for a while. In the case of Vivaldi, we go there um, for one month or as, as long as people can during the month of June. We um, include families. And you, you, because we're distributed, it's extremely important to get this kind of feeling. And during that month, we get to know each other really, really, really well. And the families get to know each other also really, really well. And, and, and they have time off. So it's a, it, 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 it's a great thing. It's a great way of working. I really like that approach. Yeah, kudos. Um, so, <clears throat> as an active, well, as an experienced executive and entrepreneur, but also as an active angel investor, maybe for the startups in the room, um, what, what are some of the tips that you would like to pass on to the, like, the new generation of startups? I mean, it, it's really hard to give generic advice. Um, in, in many ways, for me, the important thing is do not have an exit strategy, right? Think about that you're going to grow your company forever. Uh, I hate it when they have, sometimes when they have these startup uh, kind of, where they're showing off the startups and they all go up there and say, in three years, you'll get your money back 10 times. You're putting, your, I mean, you're putting yourself in a situation for a big fall. Most companies don't survive five years. But if, you, if you're saying, okay, I'm going to build the company one, after, one, after, one year after another, I'm going to build the company up and I have a plan to win. I mean, to basically su survive, and, and, and that's what you're going for. I, I think that's really important, and from that perspective also, trying to avoid investors as long as you can. You do need them, and then selecting uh, great investors. Select someone that will support you all the way and that is, is not looking for a quick exit, which is why you should not try to pitch a quick exit. Try to get the ones that want to be with you for a number of years, and, and, and obviously you have to provide an exit for your investors, but but you should be, uh, as a company, you may get sold, but I mean, it, it's not because someone buys you, it's not because you built the company for a sale. So, so for me, me that's, a, that's an important thing, that you, that you have a goal with what you're doing, and the goal is actually you're building this product because you really believe in them, not because you believe in the business plan, something. I, I don't know, I, I think people that do things out of passion have a bigger chance of succeeding than people that do it because of an Excel sheet. That's great advice. Um, so we're out of time, but 
Welcome back to the browser wars, I guess. Uh, if you haven't tried Vivaldi out, you can download it right now. Uh, what's the website? Vivaldi.com. Where does the name come from, by the way? Um, is there a connection with Opera, Vivaldi? I mean, there is some connection, but actually, I just like the name. We like the name. Uh, I had been using it for my investment company, and I've been trying to find, okay, isn't there a nice company name that has this nice ring to it that doesn't have strange spelling or anything like that? And I looked and I looked and I looked, and uh, then someone, I, I think a, a couple of people, including my son, said, why don't you use Vivaldi? You already have that. And I checked and I found, hey, it's not in use. I can buy the domains uh, for a bit of money, but I can buy them. Awesome. So, so Vivaldi.com, check it out. John, thank you very much for the chat. You.